good morning. Good to see you today. I want to say thank you, church. Yesterday, nine uh, people showed up to help us kind of spruce things up in the church, get things clean, cut back some of the brushes from the window, and just uh, do a, a general clean that uh, and detail clean that uh, don't get to do very often. And so thank you so much for that help and uh, getting us ready for Easter. Uh, this week is indeed the, is Holy Week. It is, is the week leading up to our Easter celebration. And so you have an opportunity for uh, worship and uh, to remember uh, all the events leading up to the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. So uh, we are kind of partnering again with uh, uh, the Cape Elizabeth United Methodist Church right up the road. Uh, we have done some kind of like Easter services before, and um, this week they are going to do a Maundy Thursday, which is a Thursday evening service. They're going to do that through Zoom, and um, uh, they're supposed to get me that link, and I was hoping to have it for uh, this morning, but I didn't receive that yet, but I will send that on to anyone who wants it if you want to take uh, part in an online kind of Thursday service remembering uh, it is, it's, it's the night before he was crucified. It's, it's the, the moment, the detail of the night I share every week just before we have communion when Jesus has that last supper with his disciples. And so uh, you're welcome to join them for that. And they've been invited to join us for our Good Friday service, which we will have here at 630. And it's always a service that tells the story of the crucifixion of Jesus, a very meaningful and powerful service that reminds us of the sacrifice Jesus has made for us and for our salvation. And, uh, and then on um, Easter Sunday, you're invited to join us for a sunrise service. We haven't done that in a while. And if um, you can get out of bed, <laughs> feel free to join us. Um, and uh, we're going to meet at Two Lights Road, uh, right on the end of that towards Lobster Shack. Uh, there's, there's a great collection of rocks there. It's beautiful. I've been there before. Uh, the sun's coming up at 5.55. And so I've, I've, I've been saying, hey, let's gather at 545. Uh, that way, you know, we can get together and uh, we'll see the sun come up together. We'll sing some songs and uh, we will reflect on uh, the risen Lord together during that Easter sunrise service. And then you might be wondering, well, what am I going to do after that? That's, you know, now that I'm up, well... <laughs> Hopefully, you'll come to the church and you'll join us. We'll have breakfast together. We'll enjoy uh, uh, the Easter morning together. and You can join us, and we're going to have a continental breakfast and a good time. So uh, you're welcome to do that as well. Uh, and then we will have, of course, a wonderful uh, Easter morning service. Uh, so anyway, uh, there is uh, one more announcement. After Easter, we are going to uh, begin a series with the church about praying to Pentecost. And I have a quick video I want to share with you uh, before I say anything more. Our denomination has, has recognized uh, the need for a couple things. One is, of course, the, the big one is that the Holy Spirit would work in a mighty way in our churches and in our lives. And Pentecost Sunday is always, uh, uh, you know, just, just like, I don't know, like a month and a half after Easter. And so it is June 5th this year, and uh, it, is, um, it is a day of, of remembering that the Holy Spirit has moved in a powerful way in the life of the church, and is always with his, uh, always with uh, the Lord's disciples, uh, to help us indeed speak and, and communicate the gospel and the hope of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, we are going to be joining with uh, our whole church in praying that the Holy Spirit would move in a mighty way in our churches, 
uh, in our lives and help us speak and have voice to what the Holy Spirit wants to do in our communities. And so uh, you are invited to join with us uh, uh, starting May, uh, May 1st all the way till June 5th um, in, the, in a focused time of prayer. We're going to be handing out um, some uh, uh, paperwork to help like lead in, in a moment of prayer each and every day, and you're invited to take part in that. So uh, there will indeed be half a million Nazarenes involved in this as well. And uh, we're just trusting and believing that if, if we all join together in prayer and we put our lives before God in prayer, that we might be surprised by how God is able to speak through us and work in our lives as well. And so I just wanted to give you kind of that moving forward. Uh, keep, keep that on your mind as uh, we, we prepare for that event. Let's hear the call to worship honor our Lord today. Today is Palm Sunday, a day where we remember that we get to celebrate our Lord. Oh yeah, you were given those palm branches. If there is a part in a song that you're like, oh yes, this is speak to my heart, wave that palm branch, feel free. If you, uh, if you want to wave it just to have fun, have fun this service. We have, we have these palm branches, that's okay. Uh, later on in the service, um, you're going to get an opportunity just as um, in the story you're going to hear, they lay down the palm branches before the Lord. When you come forward for communion, you'll have an opportunity to lay down your palm branches as a sign of respect and obedience to our Lord as well. And we're going to do what we did last year. Is uh, Last year at Pentecost, uh, we remembered um, that the Holy Spirit wanted to work in our life and that the Holy Spirit came in fire, and we, we had a little fire pit, and we took the dried out leaves, and we burned those, and of course those became our ashes for Ash Wednesday. And we're going to do that again, and this year it'll be after an intensive time of prayer and seeking what the Holy Spirit's going to want to do in our life. So I think it'll be a meaningful uh, uh, opportunity for us as well. Let's hear the call to worship and honor our Lord this morning. Our call to worship is from Psalm 118, verses 25 through 29. Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine on us. With bows in hand, join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. And if you'll stand with me, together we'll worship.
Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning thankful indeed that uh, we can turn our eyes upon Jesus, that we can see indeed that this journey to Jerusalem that he made, that began with words of praise and the waving and the laying down of palm branches, declaring him as Lord and King, is a prayer we want to keep, is a declaration that we want to keep on our lips, that uh, we want to continue to proclaim you as Lord in our life, as first place among all our priorities. And Heavenly Father, we are well aware where this leads. And Lord, it's my hope and it's my prayer that uh, where we have recognized indeed that uh, our voice has joined the scoffers, that Heavenly Father, we might also recognize that your grace has yet reached out, that you have been the God ever faithful to your side of things to your agreement to be our God, to your agreement to love us, to bless us. And so, Heavenly Father, it's my hope that uh, your Spirit would go with us and help us to live faithfully the way you would have us to be. Thank you, Lord, for this time of worship. We hope that this Sunday of lifting our voice up in praise and joining the crowd who declares you as King will indeed be a practice that goes with us in the days to come, that you will continue to be first in our life. Thank you again for this time of worship. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Before uh, the offering, I do want to say just a couple of things. I had forgotten a, a couple of announcements, ways perhaps we can put some prayers in, in, into practice. Or um, So uh, it, Easter Sunday is a time when we often have flowers up here as well to uh, uh, kind of remind us of the newness of life that comes with the resurrection. Easter lilies are, uh, are, are often uh, placed up here. And if you would like to bring any Easter lilies as a, as a prayerful reminder of, of a memorial or remembrance of those who have uh, gone before you and who have indeed um, uh, are recipients of, of the promise of the resurrection, feel free to do so. You're welcome to do that. Also, uh, last week I made a call that uh, we want to uh, help um, wherever we can with uh, people who are in need and our reserves of our crisis care kits, which, which are just basic necessities, the simplest of things that sometimes people have to go without when they are displaced because of tragedy, because of um, something that's happened in the world, or because they become refugees and, and sure enough our stores have gone down and we are refilling that and we're going to try to do that by the end of the month and so you saw the crisis care kits uh, list in your bulletin and uh, we've already got a table out there with what looks like four packages together I'm going to get banana boxes to put those in to ship those in and if you want to put any more together whenever you're at the grocery store or something and you want to fill some and fill out some bags feel free to do that if that's too much or that's uh, too difficult or whatever to try to, try to go through that and you just want to give an offering to crisis care kits, you can do that as well. But I want to let you know that that is one of the ways in which we can physically say, okay, how can I be a help and how can I uh, uh, be involved uh, physically in, in the prayers I'm lifting up to those who are in need. So you're welcome to do that. But at this time also we're going to come, we're going to uh, receive the offering and uh, uh, you're welcome to do so at this time.
Please be seated and receive the food of his holy word today. Good morning. Good morning. Our first reading today is from Isaiah 50, verses 4 through 9. Let's see. The Sovereign Lord has given me an instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. He wakens me morning by morning, wakens my ear to listen like one being taught. The Sovereign Lord has opened my ears, and I have not been rebellious. I have not drawn back. I offer my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pull out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. Because the Sovereign Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint, and I know I will not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who then will bring charges against me? Let us face each other. Who's my accuser? Let him comfort me. It is the Sovereign Lord who helps me. Who is he that will condemn me? They will all wear out like garment. The moths will eat them up. Your attitude should be the same of that of Christ Jesus, who, being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance of, as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that, Christ, that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of the God and the Father. Amen. Let's stand and sing our hymn together.
seated and receive our words for today. I'll share with you from uh, Luke, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19, verse 28 to 40. After he had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he had come near Bethphage and Bethany, at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Well, go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? Just say this, The Lord needs it. So those who, are, who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, The Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. And as he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that had been seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. And he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. This is, uh, this is a, a beautiful story that we read every single year right around this time. And before I do, I want to uh, tell you an another story. Now, the, th the funny thing about stories with sermons is you know, if I tell you a story at the beginning of a sermon, you know that that story has something to do with the sermon itself. That chances are I'm coming back to it, that I'm relating it in some way. And that's the nature of stories, right? It is, it's sometimes we tell a story to someone just because, I don't know, this was on our mind, we're, out, we're, we're having lunch together, and someone just wants to tell a story. Maybe it's funny, maybe it, uh, you just know that uh, they'll relate to it. But most of the time when we tell stories, even if it's just, you know, gathered together here, uh, you know, after the service, every time I come down, I'm always hearing stories from people. And most of the time it's related to something I set up here. Uh, but that's the nature of stories. It's, it's almost always related to the context. It doesn't matter whether we're having lunch or whether it was like when we were gathered together yesterday, cleaning up. It doesn't matter what it is. When we start telling stories, it's almost always related to something. Uh, in, in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus tells a lot of stories. We call them parables. They're stories with a message about who Jesus is or who God is or what the kingdom of heaven is like. And he tells a lot of stories in the Gospels, uh, not only in Luke, but in the others as, as well. So you know when those stories were recorded, they had to decide, well, how are we going to tell some of the stories Jesus told? They could have just, you know, like the book of Proverbs, just made a list of all of his stories or something like that. But stories have context. And even in the Gospel of Luke, the stories he tell, I think, sometimes illuminate for us a lot of what is happening around it. In fact, uh, this passage begins, after he had said this, there's a story a parable Jesus had told. A parable that we're probably familiar with, but a parable that helps, I think, us understand this triumphal entry, this uh, uh, going towards Jerusalem from Bethphage and Bethany when they're laying down their cloaks and they're laying down their palm branches. He tells a story, and I'm not going to read it. I'll just kind of paraphrase it, share it with you. There's a man, he says, who's getting ready to become king or getting ready to become you know, he, he, he's getting ready to receive his political influence. And he says, I'm going to go and get things set up for me to become king, for me to become the political leader. And so while I'm away, he says, I'm going to give you some money to put to work for me. And so he gives to one $10,000, he gives to another $5,000, and he gives to another $1,000. Like I said, and this is in my own way, they didn't have dollars back then. But uh, he says, hey, this is what I'm going to do. And the person with 10,000 says, okay, and he, and he puts it to work. And, you know, he's, you know he, he starts you know, buying and selling, and, and, and he makes 10,000 more. And the person with 5,000 does, does the same thing. He, he hires some people and hires them out, and, and, and he gets work done, and he brings in 5,000 more dollars. And the person with 1,000 says, oh, man, I... 
I don't know what I can do with this. I don't know what I'm going to do with this. And I do know if my investment's bad, I'm going to lose it. And if he comes back as a king or as, as a person with all this influence, the last thing I want to do is make him upset or show that I'm a failure. And so he locks it away in a safe and says, aha, no one can take it. No one can steal it. I'm just going to give it back to him. And the, and the person comes back. Having indeed come, he comes back as king and he says, I want to see while I was securing that how the money I put to work has come back. And he sees, and he sees the yield of the first one with the 10,000. He sees the yield of the second one with the 5,000 and is very impressed with him. He sees the yield of the third one who just gives him back the money that he had entrusted. What he could have just done on his own, just held on to it. And yet, uh, and he says, he says, this is unacceptable. This is not why you were given these resources. Let me give it to the person uh, who, who made good work of it. You, this, th this is not at all what I was looking for. And then he says that he is going to come as king. And the, and, the, and the story ends with him saying, and all those who do not accept this will be tossed aside. And so there's this story, this parable, where we recognize that sometimes, in some translations, it becomes the parable of the talents. And we've, we've made that reference to the talents God has given us. Or we've recognized that God often puts us in a spot where we are able to, to share or to give of what God has done, to, to, to act boldly with what God has given us, and to see how God might bless that. And that to bury it away or to hide away what God has given us is a waste of what God has called from us. And yet he has called us that with whatever he's entrusted to come and to, uh, and to work for our coming king. That is the story that precedes the story of uh, today, Palm Sunday, of uh, Jesus getting ready to ride into Jerusalem. And so in this story, we, I just want to keep that parable in mind. In this story, we find that Jesus is getting ready to go. And he tells his disciples, hey, there is, there's a colt in this one location. I want you to go and get it. How does Jesus know or, 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 or what's happening here? I've had some people wonder, you know, maybe it was prearranged and he had a colt ready to go. And like, you know, the, the word that the right person came to pick it up is the Lord needs it. Like maybe. Or, uh, or there's something else happening here as well. He asks, but he tells the disciples, hey, I know where there's a colt. Bring it. Come forward. And, uh, and when they ask, and they're going to ask who you are, what, what's this for, just tell them the Lord needs it. And what I find in this story is, in relationship to the story that just came before it is, the owners of the colt are, are in a position where they have been graced and gifted with something whether it was that they were able to purchase it or whether it was that their own horses were able to give birth to it, uh, whatever it is, they have been gifted with this colt. And when the Lord says, I need this, they are willing to give up and put to work that which God has given them so that the Lord can use it. And so I think that the colt in this story becomes a very real example for them of what the parable is about, that what we have is used in service to our Lord. And so when they say the Lord needs it, they let him have this colt. And, and, the, and the, the owner of the colt is someone who, who has been entrusted, and someone who, can, who is who's able to say, okay, I want the Lord to be able to use whatever it is I have that he might need for that. The king is on his way into Jerusalem. Jerusalem, uh, the place where indeed David had reigned, the place where they had hoped a Messiah would come and indeed set up God's kingdom again and free them from the reign of the Romans who were kind of uh, living in their territory and had taken them over. And so Jesus is getting ready to go and they are excited and they're laying their cloaks over the colt. It's like a makeshift saddle, if you will. They're putting that down. They're laying out their cloaks on the path. They are heralding him as that king. He had spent his entire ministry going around the countryside as if, according to the parable, getting ready to be called the king. He had been showing his miracles. He had indeed been showing how God had been working in their life. And finally, they are ready to receive him. They've been uh, laying out their cloaks. And this, this, it's a weird image to think of laying out cloaks 
for people to be on. I mean, like, my only image I've had of that is, like, really old movies or cartoons, right, where, like, they would put their cloak over a puddle so the woman could go over without getting splashed or someone could ride over it without getting splashed upon or getting mud up on their clothes. But it would indeed pr present and give that, that uh, protection, if you will, that Jesus walk, uh, walking on the, uh, the Roman-created road, uh, the cobblestone there, whatever dirt, whatever dust, or if it's wet, whatever mud, would indeed not be kicked up upon him. But Jesus isn't coming like a normal king. He, he, do, he doesn't have the royal robe. He doesn't have the, the fancy clothes that he has to worry about whether or not dust gets kicked up on it. He's coming in his everyday travel gear, but yet... They see him and treat him as a king. And this is a part of our challenge as well. As we go through this Easter week, what, is it, what will it be that we will see when we look at Jesus? Will it be more than just the historical figure who died? Will we be able to see indeed and testify next week that the one who had walked with us, the one who had died, is indeed the Lord our God in the flesh. And so um, they're dropping their cloaks down, and they're not guaranteed to get them back, I don't think. Yeah, yeah, they could pick them up afterwards and wash them and get the mud off and all that kind of stuff. But I think there's someone who's really unlucky who's not going to get their cloak back. Let me illustrate this just a little bit. Jen uh, had showed me a, a video uh, earlier this week. Uh, every now and again, she'll share like a, a funny video or something that she saw online or, or something cute or whatever. And there's one she had shown me about uh, a mother who was going to pick up her child from school. And she's going to go pick up her child from school. And we all do that. We've all picked up our children from school, but not quite like this lady did. You see, she got in the queue uh, behind all the other cars, but she was not in a car. She wasn't on a bike. She was on a horse, and behind her with reins was a second horse. And so she got in queue with, the, with these cars to pick up her child, and the child went and got on the other horse, and all the children were like, whoa, you get to ride a horse home? And they were amazed, and it was wonderful. Uh, like, I remember when uh, uh, we were living in South Portland, I would walk sometimes to help uh, pick up Alex from elementary school. We didn't have a horse, but we had our dog, our little puppy dog, and I'd bring her with too as well. And uh, other people started bringing their dog to the school as well to pick up their children. And after a while, the school had to put out a, a note that said, stop bringing your dogs to pick up the kids. Because what they realize is when everyone's bringing their dogs to pick up the kids, not everyone's cleaning up after the dogs. <laughs> and, so, and so I said to Jen, I said to Jen as I'm watching this video, I'm like, those horses don't have poop bags. So you're not going to be able to keep doing that forever. <laughs> And then I started thinking, and now I'm thinking that while I'm looking at this sermon, I'm going, oh no, someone's not going to want to pick up their cloak. <laughs> someone's losing the cloak lottery. <laughs> and so, and so I, I found myself thinking about that, as gross as it is, I found myself thinking about this, is there is no guarantee in what we lay down before the Lord that it's going to yield the results that we had intended. There's no guarantee that we get what we thought we might have gotten out of that. And so let's think about some of the things that we might do or, uh, out of sacrifice or out of giving to the Lord. And so uh, when I think of evangelism, when I think of sharing our personal story with those around us, when I think of t inviting someone else to church or think about uh, sharing our faith with someone else, we don't know how people will always respond. It may not always yield the result we had intended, but yet... We are still called where God gives us opportunity to share what he has done in our life and to lay that before him. That the, that the experiences and the graces and the gifts God has given us are not to be hoarded and buried, right? But to be laid out before God and put to work for him to see what happens. Sometimes we make sacrifices and we, and we give or we do something. Say, okay, God, I'm going to give this or I'm going to do this. And, and we, we hope that it yields the return that we, uh, we would expect. But it doesn't always. I, I asked Alex for permission to share this story this morning. So I'm going to share this. So uh, last week, um, Alex surprised us. We were getting ready for church. And, uh, and he said, hey, Mom, Dad, I want to I give some of my own money to church next week. And we said, okay, that's fine. You can do that. 
And, uh, and which is interesting, like, because, you know, he doesn't have an allowance, he doesn't have uh, a job, so he doesn't have a regular source of income where we can teach tithing. All he gets is what he sees here uh, when, when we give. And so, uh, and, and so uh, but this day he said, without any kind of pushing, he said, hey, I'd like to give. And I said, okay. And I thought, okay, he's going to grab a couple bucks and he's going to do that. No, he got his whole collection in a bag <laughs> with all the coins and stuff and to, to give. And I thought, oh, the counters are going to love this. And so, so, he, so he got all this together and, and he gave uh, last, last week in church. And, and then afterwards, he's um, uh, talking with uh, Jen downstairs and, and he's wondering, you know, oh, no, I just, just gave everything. <laughs> and he's, he's wondering about that. And, um, and something, something happened after, after he's, he's talking about how he felt about, you know, having done that. Someone in the church, uh, I'm not going to tell you who, who it is, um, but their initials are. <laughs> uh, uh, someone in the church went up to Alex and said, um, and said hey, I wanted to give this to you, and gave, gave him a $20 bill. And um, it was more than he had given. And... Um, and Alex was like, wait, what? And it was just, it was just a gift. And, and, uh, and Alex's eyes got really big. And he's like, I can't, I can't believe this. I wasn't expecting this. And, and like, especially I'd never done that before either. And, um, and, and so Jen is able to have a conversation with him about how sometimes in life, when we give, God multiplies the gift. And that's a story that's told in Scripture. And this, of course, doesn't always happen because when we give, we're not giving just looking at what we can get in return because like, the financial return doesn't always happen that way. Oftentimes, we've got to tell them, is sometimes there are other intangible returns, that blessings in which we are experiencing or we get to be a part of because we've given. And so this became a teaching moment for that. But those sacrifices we give don't always have those moments. Sometimes we just give or we sacrifice time or we do something and say, okay, did this yield what I wanted it to yield? I hope so. I don't know. Discipleship. We disciple one another, whether it's, whether it's Sunday school class or, or it's at home with your family. And, but it doesn't always yield what you hope, right? Children don't always grow up with the faith that you had molded and shaped uh, in their life. But in those moments when it seems like, you know, we've laid things down before the Lord and, you know, we lost the cloak lottery. In those moments, uh, the question should never be, well, would I do that again? <laughs> of course. It's not, oh no, should I hide? Should I keep what God has given? To do that is to become that unfaithful servant who hides the talents, always willing to lay down before the Lord so that He can work and do and give opportunity for what the Lord wants to do in our life. We're nearing the end of the, uh, of the Lenten fast. Last week, Howard was joking with me about uh, on Easter, we're going to have to go out for drinks afterwards because both of us... Uh, Gave up soda. <laughs> and so, he, so he's like, hey, we're going to have to go out, you know, I'm going to have to have my Pepsi, you're going to have to have your due. And, uh, and, uh, but we're getting to the near the end of that fast, right, where we get to say, okay, maybe I can pick up that cloak again. <laughs> maybe, I can, maybe I can move forward where I can pick up what, what's been laid down. But in our walk of faith, there, there have been moments, of course, and there will be moments when the returns aren't always guaranteed, when the sacrifice has to be longer lasting where the call to faithfulness is a little more pressing or a little more nerve-wracking or a little more, oh, I, I'm really putting myself out there. And, but Lent, hopefully, has been a journey of remembering this and preparing ourselves for those moments of saying, hey, I give up something small and, and really kind of meaningless, and really just kind of like self-indulgent perhaps, or, some, or maybe, depending on what someone's done, something really, truly difficult to give up as a way of preparing for whatever faithfulness God might call upon in our life. And so this is what they do. They lay down their cloaks in preparation for what God is going to do through Jesus Christ as He comes into Jerusalem. And so they start crying out, blessed is the King, 
Blessed is the king. They are calling him first in his life. They are calling him the Lord. They are saying, hey, you are the one. They are turning all their eyes on him, and they are believing that he has finally come. He's going to be able to change everything. He's going to be able to install God's kingdom. He's going to be able to deliver them from the Romans. He, he is, he's going to be everything they had hoped. Blessed is the king. They honor him. They praise him. Uh, in, in the other books, uh, in the other, like in Matthew, that's where we get the word Hosanna. They are crying out Hosanna in the highest they are recognizing that the one in the parable has finally come and he has come as king and they are ready to uh, anoint Jesus as this. And of course, the Pharisees have an issue with this. They've had an issue with Jesus before. One too many times he's corrected them, he's embarrassed them, but he's asking him to stop. No, you can't go, you can't come with disciples crying out that you're king. You've gathered a whole large crowd. I mean, the story leading up to that parable even is he's done miracles, and now they're following him. Tax collector Zacchaeus is coming and saying, hey, I'm sorry I've wronged people. They're following him. He tells all of them this parable, and now he's coming in, now he's riding in on this colt, and, and the Pharisees are worried. A crowd welcoming someone in, calling, uh, calling out that he's king. They're worried about Caesar. They're worried about rebellion. You can't call someone else king when there's a foreign power saying, I'm your king, and has the military might to enforce it. You want to know what happens if you do that? Well, we don't have to look very far. We don't have to look further than Ukraine to see what happens when civilians say to an invading force, you're not my king, someone else is. We see what happens when things like that happen. So the Pharisees say, watch out. You can't do this. We have to just kind of let the one who has the power have the power. But Jesus says that if they don't, the stones are crying out. The rocks are going to worship. The, all of creation is going to testify to who he is. And this is a reference to Jesus being Lord over all the earth. This is a way for him to say, hey, this is our calling to recognize what God wants to do in our life and recognize who Jesus is. But Jesus, as the Son of God, is Lord over the entire earth. The heavens cry out. The rocks will cry out. All the earth will testify about who he is before the Lord, for he is the creator. This is his way of saying, not only must we give voice, but all of creation is under Jesus Christ. He is Lord over it all. And all of that gets confirmed in the resurrection that we will be celebrating next week. Showing indeed that our God reigns and rules over whatever this world looks like. He has victory over death. He has victory over sin. And he has victory over the powers of this world. And so that we are a people who can know that as we lay down our lives before God, whatever happens, whatever he has given us, we, we return back to him saying, Lord, I've been faithful tried to be faithful with what you have given in hopes that you would work and you would multiply. And so my hope is that as we go into this week, as, as we get ready to pray for how the Holy Spirit is going to continue to, to work in our lives and in our communities, that we would be saying, Lord, wherever you put me, whatever you have given me, I, I give over to you in service, in obedience, in trust, because you are Lord, you are King, and you can have it all. For Him to be Lord over all the earth, that even the stones would cry out means in our life as well, that we would be able to say that when it comes down to it, all of our allegiance, all of, every, all of our uh, faith rests and resides in this one, Jesus Christ, who came and is the Son of God, who showed us what it was to live, to love, to, uh, to reflect indeed God's hope for his people. And so we follow him and trust in obedience that our God will continue to be with us, that our God will show us 
not only that uh, we can live as Jesus lived, but his spirit will be with us to help and guide along the way. Our call is just to lay before him whatever it is that God has given and the work that uh, he has done, that uh, he would be Lord in our life. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, this morning, I thank you for... um, I thank you for the opportunity to praise you, to lift you up as our king, as our primary leader, as as the one who we want to follow over anybody else. And Heavenly Father, it is my hope today that uh, we would recognize where you have blessed us abundantly. Heavenly Father, where that blessing uh, goes beyond just financial but our skills, our thoughts, our relationships, the people we know. And Heavenly Father, I pray that indeed you help us to have voice, that you help us to be able to speak about who you are. And that, Lord, as difficult as that may be, as uncertain as we might be of of, of what that's going to yield, let us do so in true trust and faith that you are the God who continues to work today throughout your creation to show that you are still saving and sanctifying the lost. And Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to be a part of that. And it's my hope and my prayer that whatever it is, however small, that if you say the Lord needs it, we'll say, here it is. Thank you, Heavenly Father, again for this time. We pray that you would help us to be be obedient in our worship and in our lives. Let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Uh, We're going to uh, uh, receive communion today. It is uh, a service in which we remember on the night which he was betrayed, the day that we celebrate as Maundy Thursday, by the way, uh, um, and you can celebrate that with uh, some brothers and sisters right up the road online. Uh, On that night in which he was betrayed, that he had his disciples gather around him and he lifted up bread, gave thanks, said, This is my body which is broken for you. And, and he gave thanks uh, for, with the cup too, but he said to them, This is my blood which is poured out for you. And We always take the bread in remembrance that uh, he's died for us and our sins are no longer held against us, which is why I often recite uh, the phrase from Emmanuel, uh, Take and eat this and may it preserve you blameless unto everlasting life. Is because we know that the grace of God doesn't hold sin against us anymore. And uh, the, the blood which is poured out for our salvation, and I always say take and drink this in remembrance and, um, and uh, to be thankful because this is, this is his sacrifice reminding us that indeed uh, we can draw near to God and there is no longer anything keeping us away from him. So we're going to come forward, we're going to receive these elements. It's going to be um, a reminder of the sacrifice Jesus has made for us and we are going to celebrate that uh, Remember that. I don't know if that's a better word or whatnot. It is a little bit of a somber service, but we'll do that on Good Friday, this coming Friday at 6.30, and you're welcome to join us. We'll remember, indeed, um, the entire story of how Jesus allowed the world to be the world, but yet uh, did so, always inviting and welcoming us to something more that God could do. And uh, you're welcome to come forward and receive the elements. And when you do, I'd invite you to bring your palm branch with you. And uh, I'm going to stand on this side of the table this way, even though we'll still come the same way. And uh, feel free to lay your palm branch down uh, on this altar table as kind of a sign, a remembrance of, uh, hey, whatever the Lord wants me to lay down, whatever the Lord wants me to do with what he's given me, I'm willing to do that. If you want to do that as a symbol, of, of, as a statement of faith, feel free to do so uh, when you come up to receive the elements. And uh, we'll do that together.
before we receive the bread, bow your heads for a moment. Praise and thank God for characteristic or something about God. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. Before we drink the cup, which is a sign, Christ's blood poured out for us, bow your heads and uh, just say to God how you feel about him and how you will give yourself before him. Take and drink this in remembrance and be thankful. We're going to sing together the wonderful cross. A way of remembering indeed how his body has been broken and his blood shed for us. Let's sing this together. Welcome to Stand Together.
This is indeed his wonderful life given over for us. I don't know what opportunities God is going to give you this week to lay out your cloak, to say, hey, you deserve all, you deserve everything. And, uh, but I trust and I believe that you can be faithful and God's Spirit will be with you to help you be faithful. Indeed, to see how God might multiply the work that He's already done in your life. Go in His grace. Amen.